Have you ever wondered how mirrors work in video games? In the past, mirrors were difficult and taxing feats to pull off, but new advancements in graphics cards and AI processing are changing all of that with a technique you might have heard of called ray tracing. This method has typically been reserved just for graphics and CGI, nothing really interactive, but in recent years, it's gained wide use in games. So ray tracing basically simulates light and how it behaves in an environment. Ray tracing shoots rays from the camera to objects in the 3D space, rendering only what the player can see. These rays then bounce around the geometry of the space and eventually go back to the light source, calculating how much light is received by each object and how the light should react. Because light doesn't actually exist in games, naturally, neither do reflections. If a game needs a reflective surface, it needs to be simulated. And that's a lot of extra work. That's why you see so many mirrors in games that are cracked or too dirty to see anything in. To simulate a working mirror, you would have to allow the game camera to render what's in front of it, as well as what's behind it, effectively doubling the amount of geometry and textures rendered, which, as you can imagine, isn't ideal. So developers do have a few tricks to create reflections. An exciting way to achieve this is through a technique called planar reflections. Planar reflections actually render the surrounding level again from the mirror's perspective, meaning that what you see isn't actually a reflection, but a duplicate of the room you're in. To complete the illusion, as a player gets close to a planar reflection, a duplicate character model is spawned into the game world and the player's controller inputs are inverted, which which actually creates an incredibly convincing effect. Because making realistic reflections is taxing on gaming hardware and simulating them is a ton of work, it's kind of easy to imagine why developers would largely avoid putting reflections in a game and find just any creative excuse possible to obscure them. A less taxing technique for creating reflections is called cube mapping. A static 2D texture map is generated of a surrounding environment and projected onto the inside of a cube, much like a skybox. Hey, remember we talked about those? A reflective object in a game can use the color information information from inside of the cube to approximate a reflection based on the position of the player camera. However, with this technique, the reflections created are not the most accurate and generally have a hard time scaling as the player moves. Often a filter or a blur effect can be applied to distort the original cube map and make the reflection feel a little more cohesive with the game world. Similar to cube mapping, another reflection technique is called screen space reflections. They're great for modeling less detailed reflections. Let's use the example of a puddle on the ground. Basically, it takes no of what's in your character's immediate vicinity and then projects a version of that onto the puddle. As a result, screen space reflections can be more detailed and accurate than, say, cube mapping, but that also comes at the price of processing depending on how deep the reflection goes. That's why screen space reflections are generally great for subtle reflections like puddles or wet surfaces. Ultimately, cube mapping, planar reflections, screen space reflections, they've all been combined over the last 20 or so years to bring us convincing reflections in video games. The downside of these techniques is that for the most part, a lot of lighting is just already baked in. However, with Nvidia and AMD discovering new ways to achieve real-time ray tracing, the way simulations light works in video games is changing entirely, which means so are the reflections. So in the past, if a game developer wanted light to act dynamically within a game, they would have to account for that and budget processing power and memory accordingly. That's why so many stealth games have lights you can shoot out, and so many more that you can't. Lighting in games in the past has largely been an illusion, carefully crafted by environment artists who specialize in lighting specifically. They have to carefully plot out how many different types of lights they can use and where they can go based on hardware and software or limitations. Compare that to ray tracing, where you could have a player break apart an environment and have the broken pieces of that environment cast their own dynamic shadows. A really good way to think about why ray tracing is so impressive is that it unlocks the ability for game developers to create reflections in real time, simulating the way actual light would behave as a player moves through a dynamic environment. It's that adaptive, live aspect to it that's so impressive. Like we said before, this tech has been at work in film for a while now, but that's because animations and CGI graphics are just a series of frames that can be rendered for 12 plus hours at a time if need be. Games aren't static like that. With something interactive, frames need to be rendered in a fraction of a second and account for dynamic objects as well as unpredictable player movements. The immense amount of computing power needed for real-time ray tracing is what companies like NVIDIA 
Nvidia and AMD have recently solved with new chip architectures for processors in modern graphics cards. We hear the term ray tracing tossed around a lot in marketing these days, but hopefully this video gives you an idea of why it's more than just a buzzword to slap on game boxes. This technique, while still relatively new, is the future of lighting tech in games. These are the type of advancements that bring us into new hardware generations. Ray tracing is a big, big deal in games development right now. And hopefully, now you understand why.